Hospitals Asian Camp H, one of the largest mental health communities or organizations. And one of their stats on their website speaks to one in five Canadians experience mental illness at any given year. And now the difference, I mean, we all experience matters of mental health, but I will speak to mental illness shortly after, but I just wanted to let you know this, the difference in the heaviness of stats. So one in five will have experienced matters of mental illness, whereas we all experience ups and downs in our mental health. Uh, there is a, I believe, three-time cancer survivor who was quoted for saying, um, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I knew my doctors were going to take care of me. But with my mental health, I got lost in the cracks. And so this speaks to, again, when it came to this person's physical health, something that was more well-versed, well-known, visible to the eye of the doctor, they knew for sure they'd be well taken care of. But when it came to something invisible as their mental health, this person stresses that they were lost in the cracks. Because our mental health often gets un 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 overlooked. Our mental health is often something not only that doctors, even greatly trained physicians, tend to bypass when it comes to like, oh, you're bleeding, let's take care of the blood. Versus your mental health, your mood has not shifted. You've been low for a while. That often gets overlooked. Right? So I stress these stats here to remind you the difference. This is a paradigm I often show my, my clients, again, to help them understand the scale of our mental health. The, the aim is to, to not be at one state all the time, but to be more so on the right hand <laughs> uh, of the scale. So we go from burnt out, where our mental health is not so great, we're experiencing some kinds of disability, different symptoms, or we're barely in survival, the middle is fine. We're not perfect. We're in our window of tolerance, we're managing, you know, bills still need to be paid, work is working, <laughs> school is schooling, parents are parenting, kids are getting on your nerves the same way, but we are managing, we're coping day to day with the realistic methods. Now when, we're, when our mental health is poor, we're not able to cope well with the everyday challenges that come with your life. But when we are managing, when we're taking breaks, when we are communicating, when we are leaning into support networks, social networks, for those of us of faith, prayer, and different spiritual elements and coping strategies, then we start to enter into the thriving part of this paradigm, where we have more awareness. We embrace education about our health in all capacities, and we literally experience growth. This is, can be as um, minimal as hair growth, because you're not stressing anymore. This could be growth like physically, your body is no longer stunted, particularly for youth as Samantha was speaking to, to children. That's a number of one sign for when children who are going through uh, lots of trauma or stress that they're not growing at the average rate they should be. They're malnourished, even, right? That's when we know they're on the, the, the left scale, left side of, of the paradigm. So I pause here just because I really want to stress and reiterate, mental health is something we all experience, we all have. It is, dare I say, a scale. Picture it as this wellness paradigm. We have our ups and our downs. We aim to be well, which one could consider synonymous being neutral, but that is not synonymous with perfect. Okay. Okay. Janessia, yeah? please turn down the TV or go outside and play. Turn off the TV and go outside, please. I'm hearing your stuff. Hmm? I'm on a support network, not my social network, because they only see me in one way, one lens, one hat. You are a holistic, multifaceted human being. You just, you are deserving of being, like, you're, you should be able to cry, and that doesn't impact the fact that you're a professor, and you should become host, right? Like, so this is important to knowing who's in your support network for the well-being of your mental health. Appraisal support, 
we turn to these people when we need a second opinion, be it about parenting, courting, dating, relationships, major life transitions. You trust this, this person's advice. They've given you advice before. Um, they've given you, they've shared their wisdom, their opinion, and you found it valuable. You leave the conversations with these people and you feel like filled, right? They give you sound wisdom and they take sound wisdom from you as well. These people are part of your of no support now. This is often a person or thing. This could be Google, as it is for many of my clients, or it could be someone uh, like a, a financial advisor, someone in your community, not necessarily a friend or family member, but someone of uh, sometimes, right? So I pause here just to reiterate these different types of support all are deserving of them. And knowing who lies in what category in your support network is often what helps us maintain our mental health. Because we, can, we are not meant to just do this thing called life alone. Our mental health cannot stay stable alone. I'm not saying that everyone must be married or everyone must have a millions of friends, no. But everyone is deserving of a support network, a shoulder to cry on, someone to get wisdom from, someone to have concrete conversations uh, with, right? To reason with, and this is very helpful for, for our mental health, our well-being, ability to manage day-to-day -day challenges. Now, if I pause here for a second, I just want to ask, are there any questions, particularly about mental health, before I shift to mental illness? You can put it in the chat, or if you'd rather wait till the end, that's okay too. No? Okay, so I'm gonna pause if that's okay with Samantha. I'm gonna pause and go right into matters of mental illness. Just one second. Open up this slide. Okay, okay. So what I'm about to share right now, maybe I'll do a little bit of introduction. What I'm about to share right now is the research. He's a professor of psychology who recently presented to you. Here. This Mr. Backman has done great research on family dynamics, mental illness, particularly in the family. And which, so when I got the invite to do this presentation, I thought, wow, this is perfect timing to share the notes and knowledge I got from Professor Backman's presentation. And particularly something that stood out to me was when he shared the 13 signs of mentally ill family, or the 13 signs of a mentally ill. Family. So if you remember now, mental health is something we all experience. We envision it to be like a paradigm or a scale of how we balance and cope throughout our day. Whereas mental illness, now these are actual like diagnosed uh, disorders. These are um, these now are diagnosed conditions, I should say, that affect our thoughts, our behaviors, and emotions. So think of matters of like um, uh, OCD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. These literally impact how we show up in the world on a daily basis. So uh, someone who's schizophrenic, would, you know, their mental health uh, paradigm would be consistently uh, sometimes in, in the left side because of this condition that they are uh, diagnosed with unless, or, uh, unless they are getting support consistently. A combination of often uh, therapy, talk therapy, holistic uh, types of supports, and sometimes even medication, depending on the severity. So what I'm about to share with you, uh, with everyone's consent, uh, is 13 signs of a mentally ill family. To which Dr. Professor Vaknin uh, shares that if we have six of these signs or less, we are quite a normal family. So please don't be frightened or triggered if you're hearing some of these signs. No family is perfect. I want to stress this right away. <laughs> if you have six of these signs, um, under six, there, sorry, you are considered using this research. Um, normal, quote unquote, healthy family who has challenges, ups and downs, like the rest of us. And now if you're six or more, your family is now breeding some mental illnesses within the family that need to be addressed. This is not me condoning anyone's family or shaming anyone's family. Rather, bringing the stats to you, I want to make this very clear. And so I don't wish or aim to trigger anyone, but if you find some of the content I'm about to share to be uh, a, a, a lot please feel free to, you know, mute me, turn off the camera, do what you need to do. 
so that you are comfortable. I'm going to try and zoom in and pause it or talk at everyone. So this, again, I, want to, this, I don't want to steal anyone's research. This is the research of Professor Sam Bakman. You can research him and look up the, the I think this year was the fifth World Mental Health Con uh, Congress, and he was one of the speakers there. So sign number one, all are alike, are alike one. So there's no individuality. That's a sign of a, a mental illness in the family. This notion of everyone having to be uniform, everyone having to be the exact same very synonymous with the cult or the essence of the army where we all have the same haircut we all have this eat the same meal we all do the same thing no one is allowed or uh, encouraged <laughs> to be their unique being right where you, there is no way your whole family is born with the exact same identity yet whenever there is a family that has, has mannerisms that does not permit you to express yourself or be, have any unique individual factors this is a sign of a mentally ill family. A family that is going to brew or evidently has uh, the, the nature or the breeding grounds for mental illness to be produced. Can I get any uh, context? Any, everyone understand what I've just stated of sign number one? Mm -hmm. You understand? Give me thumbs up, questions, concerns. Then I think the valley does it now as a yes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So then, oh, I see some things in the chat. Understand. Understand. Thank you. Number two, perfectionism. As it stands, literally, um, focusing on the parents versus like the actual content. So the, the, the uh, for all the here, we're looking for the A plus. What happened? You got 9.5 out of 10. What is it? Rather than saying, great job, I'm so proud of you, it's the first comment. So what happened to the other 0.5? You couldn't just come with a 10 out of 10, right? Now, this is common. A lot of us, particularly mm -hmm. like Black mm -hmm. families, will say, oh, that sounds like my mom. That yeah. sounds just like my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad, and I believe you, many of our Caribbean parents particularly were very hard on our academics. What happened? You've been studying all night. Look from when I told you to take your book, you should have came home with a 10 out of 10. This is a form of perfectionism. Yeah. Now remember, if you have under six of these, you are a normal family. So don't condemn yourself. But this, to the, it, it, as a character trait of everyone, brews a mentally ill family. Mm -hmm. Number three, rigidity. Being rigid, uncompromising, very punitive research does show that now if this is the nature of the family dynamics, again, you are setting the, the, the floor for brewing mental illness. Not just someone who's having a low, a low mood or having an off day every now and then. You're literally brewing grounds for someone to be constantly on the lower end of that paradigm that I showed earlier. They're constantly going to be under pressure. They're constantly going to feel doubting their gut. Their, their, their Abilities. They're constantly going to be down their self-esteem, their self-confidence, because the, the family dynamics are very rigid. This or that, right? You either eat this or you don't eat at all. You either good or you're not. You're either pretty or you're not. Skinny or you're fat. There's no room for in between. There's no scale. There's no transition, right? And that that atmosphere brews mental illness. Number four. Feel free to interrupt if you have any questions, concerns. By the way, number four. Enforces a narrative that includes sanctions of disloyalty. So this now, so this, this notion of this notion of like uh, sanctioning disloyalty. No matter what, we are loyal to the family. No matter what happens, come hell or high water. I've heard this phrase numerous times in therapy. We are loyal to the family. Now, if you can only think of positive, healthy things when I say no matter what, then this number four may look confusing to you. But there are many individuals who experience trauma within their very own household. There are, very, there are many individuals who experience rape. There are many individuals who experience bullying in their very own household, not at school, not at the, at the camp, in their very own household. And if the essence of the family is no matter what, <laughs> We are loyal to family. You are brewing. This is brewing the grounds for mentally mental illness within the family or a mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Number five, 
emergent roles are assigned but mismatched, creating an imbalance in competition. So this is the notion of people getting roles that don't even fit. Like the, it's not even large. Oh, you're um, you're the, the the dumb one in the family. We haven't even looked at your IQ. We don't even see your progress. You just came home with one bad score, and now your nickname for decades is just the dumb one. And nobody can stop calling you the dumb one. All now, all when you graduate from college, university, you've improved. You're just the dumb one because the family dynamics are. This is your name. This is your role. There's no growth. Oh, you're the ugly one. Even when you grow fully into your body and accept yourself and you're carrying yourself well, you're still the ugly one. Right? Oh, you're the bad mind one. Oh, you're the, the sheep, the black sheep of the family. Oh, you're the hero. You don't know why you are the hero, but you've been burdened now with the role of the hero. And the, the family that does not allow you to grow or shift or acknowledge even your progress is a family that can mental illness. This is a brewing grounds for family members to become mentally ill. Not just have off days, not just having challenges coping with the challenges of life, literally brewing grounds for you to get closer and closer to needing diagnosis. Getting closer and closer to you having the personality type that has challenges emotionally and, and socially in today's uh, uh, environment and society. That's what uh, number five speaks to. Number six, this is a common one unspoken and implicit understandings um there's like a unspoken rules that we have to follow in, in this family so we all know that uncle so and so drinks and mm -hmm. is most likely an alcoholic but we, we don't we don't talk ill about him we don't uh, we don't get help we don't bring up the word alcoholism we just it's unspoken rule we just accept it as it is implicit understandings we hide the dirty laundry or we know so that the children aren't comfortable around that person, particularly the female children aren't comfortable around this person. But every year we still let that person come to the family gatherings and sit right beside the, the children. We just, it's unspoken rule, we just take ignore Africa, it does not happen. Now families that have this behavior or allow this, again, brewing grounds for mental illness within the family. And the more we hide this, the more we pretend the more we become a mentally ill family. I'm hoping you guys are noticing the pattern, the impact of these character traits. Drastically change. You go from maybe an individual who's having addiction or substance issue or mental health issues to a family who's now brooming mental illness. The more and more we have, we have these character traits. Uh, number seven. Socially coercive by shunning or emotional blackmail, coercion, everything is transactional. This is the notion of like, uh, you're almost uh, some of my younger clients use the phrase cancel culture, right? So you do something wrong and you're, you're done. And unless you do something worthy of the popular people in the family or the elderly people in the family and something transactional, you don't get welcomed back. And so if this person is not talking to you, everyone notices and they don't talk to you either. If this person says you shouldn't get invited, you're not getting invited. Unless you've done something transactional that that person wants, right? Uh, people pleasing to a certain degree, you are shunned from the family. A form of a mental illness, brewing mental illness in the family. Number eight, it's quite graphic, but hear me out. Wrongful intimacy. It's known that many individuals who, who have been diagnosed with mental illness, research shows that, that um, sometimes they are uh, often raised in a family that brews many of these characteristics of these Shania. characteristics you're hearing. And in other words, raised in a mentally ill mm -hmm. family. And almost 99% of the time, there are some there are some in inappropriate and unbordered um, intimacies. Shania. In other words, uh, Sonia, sex without hello. Consent. Mm -hmm. in a, a sex with younger individuals, mm -hmm. uh, incest within the family, inappropriate, wrongful work. intimacies happening in mentally ill families. And individuals with mental illness often experience or have experienced a lot of wrongful intimacies, resulting in various types of trauma.
God, I never expect this. Uh oh. Jeez. We have one part, one time you put your own in there. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No fun for my family already. Hmm? No fight gone on my family already. Uh oh. Yeah, it's no need for my family. Uh oh. No need for my family. Just alive. Caribbean culture for it. Yeah, man. Control. Control, control, control. You know, see, man, I have people on tonight. Mm, you remember me saying that? Yes, and I'm on. Say, Fred, I'm in tonight, bro. Mm. I'm not being so tired of it. Mm. I can do three of them. Yes, sir. All right, so everyone is joining back. We went off and we are coming back. I'm not finding the, the record. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Um, we're not able to hear you, Samantha. You're not hearing me? and dwelling on the past this is often mm. now a sign of a family if that continues this will prove mental illness and a mentally ill family number 10 bear with me we only have 13 and this is more emphasis on negative emotions and experiences than positive so we will we're, uh, we tend to just be a very negative brewing family this is not someone who's just very critical or loves to give constructive criticism. This is the essence of a family where the, the negativity is the, the norm, mm. right? Like the, what, they, what they pinpoint first, what they notice, what they talk about. This is like the height of just of gossiping. There's individuals who maybe love to hear or, or gossip. The, now this type of family dynamic is only wanting to talk well on the negative gossip. I must develop a scale, it's just the negativity. 
And to, to many of us, this is this is absurd. This is hard to even imagine. But believe me, or believe you or not, there are many clients who uh, come to, to therapy because they uh, maybe they date someone and they see their their partner's family dynamics and they realize like, oh, this is it's not normal to only talk about the negative. It, like I go to the, my partner's family dinners and I'm noticing they congratulate each other. About it. They don't make fun of someone when they get laid off or fired. Like they're not just only dwelling on the negative. I didn't know this was such a thing as many clients and this is what brings them to workshops therapy like hey hold on i've noticed i've gotten exposed to some healthier dynamics now and i'm now realizing that in my family or in my family dynamic uh, uncle so-and-so or auntie so-and-so grandma so was always only talking about the negative and i grew up thinking that was a custom to just nitpick to only look at the negative and this is often what leads most likely a, a lot to ocd this, this essence of perfectionism, wanting everything to be perfect, and don't even try unless you, you have it down to a T. This is one of the common ones that bruise. That's a common mental illness that bruise. That bruise from this notion of like uh, always idolizing, sorry, always placing emphasis on the negative emotions and experience. Number eleven, role reversals. This one is heartbreakingly too common. Mm -hmm. Children being treated like adults being parentified. This often happens in black communities when we have uh, what society deems the broken home. I, I am not fond of this phrase, but the, the home that does not have the, the best support. The home where the seesaw is imbalanced. The home where one there's one parent or one caregiver and they're working numerous jobs for the sake of trying to hold down the fort. Right? This is often one where the roles are reversed. You're 13, oh, she's 13 and she's so mature. No, she's parentified. Her roles have been switched. She is, her, her childhood has been robbed from her. This is not someone who's mature. This is someone who has been parentified. There's a difference between raising a preteen or a teen to be able to know their chores that are age appropriate and realistic for their well-being versus literally making a child an adult. Making, giving a child the responsibilities of a, another parent in the home. Sending a child to a part-time job before they've even received their driver's license. And not just to make funds, or I'm not talking about the newspaper, just give them something to do because they, you're dependent on their funds. This child is now being parentified. And this bruise, this role reversal, this bruise mental illness. Number 12, this is now the, the essence of families where many family members are unable to find true happiness. I can never say this word, absolutely forgive me, <laughs> ego dystonic. The notion of like, this is classic side of this is people, as soon as they are of age or find any resources, they want to leave this family dynamic right away. And when you ask like, hey, what's going on? Why did you leave home so early? Or what is the notion of everything being done in that home or in that family goes against their core values. Even while their core values are being are still they're still learning their core values but they recognize from a young age that something is very wrong here where this in this family nothing is off limits in this family we're going grocery shopping and we're stealing the groceries and it's natural in this family we're taking drugs the first thing in the morning right in front of the children while breastfeeding nothing is off limits in, in this family whether it's substance abuse physical abuse emotional abuse wrongful intimacies nothing is off limits we cross core values, and this has nothing to do with one's faith or religion. These just innately individuals who uh, were grown or raised in these family dynamics, they report things such as nothing was off limits. There was nothing that was not allowed. And they were exposed to this from a very young age, and this bruised mental illness, because you have no limits now, and it goes against your very core values. Number 13. Uh, Professor Sam Bakunin closes his presentation with the notion of mentally ill families create mentally ill people. Mentally ill families create mentally ill people. One could argue vice versa. Mentally ill people create mentally ill families when they're paired as, as well. And more importantly, I close off with noting that insecure attachment styles and mental health issues brew in mentally ill families. The family becomes the embodiment of some form of mental disturbance. And so that insecure attachment, that inability to understand that, okay, mom has just left the room, but she's coming back. She's giving me some verbal uh, communication or, or, or um, nonverbal communication, a sign of warmth. 
She smiled in my direction. She said, sweetheart, I'll be right back. There's no consistency that I can trust. Mom will be right back. Dad will be right back. There's none of that. That is not the norm. And that insecure attachment can happen when we have wrongful intimacies, when we're constantly thinking about the negatives, when we're brewing perfectionism, when we're idealizing the past, all of these, from 1 through 12, brew an insecure attachment. And when, we, when everyone develops an insecure attachment, we are getting closer and closer to becoming mentally ill, not just having challenges with our mental health, but becoming mentally ill. And so I know this was a lot. And I did not want to overwhelm or trigger anyone, but I thank you all uh, for listening. And I hope that through this, you can allow yourself to like, be honest and say, like, you know, what have I seen? What have I been exposed to? And a matter of like, if you had under six of these signs and uh, that show, this is what a normal family has. No family is perfect. There's no such thing. Yeah, no but if you have more than six, for some even more than 10, then these are cause for concern. And I would definitely suggest mm -hmm. some support. At this time, I want to hand back over to Samantha. <laughs> speechless, speechless. That's how you make me feel. This is you like they're hearing me. Are you hearing me now? I don't know if anyone has any questions or... I'm hearing you now, yes. Oh, yes. speechless, speechless. That's how you make me feel. Sonia, I'm speechless. <laughs> oh my God. Wow, that was... <laughs> that was... What's the word? I don't know. <laughs> Overwhelming. Oh my God! I've never <laughs> thought that I, I never yeah, thought that I would I see it I so clear yeah. in front of my eyes. Wow! 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 <clears throat> wow! Great, mm. great presentation. Food for thought. A lot to think about. Mm. Wow. So what do we do if we we now find out that we have over the six? What do we do? Mm -hmm. no, a very realistic question. Um, often the first step is of the awareness. Like we have to name what are the ones that really struck a chord with you? Not just because they were profound or shocking, but they struck a chord because you can you uh, you heard the definition and all of a sudden you thought of someone's name. Or you heard the definition, all of a sudden you remembered a childhood memory, or you remembered an mm -hmm. adult memory. Like those are the first we do, first thing we do when recovering or healing in matters therapeutically is building that awareness. What did you remember? What struck a chord with you, and why? Let's talk about it. Name it. No longer just keep it as a subconscious memory. Now yeah. that was provoked because you came to this presentation. You heard Sonia speak. Like, what? What was it? Let's air it out in a safe space. This is not something you need to now publicize, obviously, but this is something you need to speak and name, call it what it is. Then mm -hmm. after we've now done what's called the awareness, I often remind my clients that awareness provokes change. Mm -hmm. In a safe space, awareness will provoke healthy change. In an unsafe space, awareness is dangerous. Awareness can get you killed, particularly yeah. as a person of color in America or North America. Right? Awareness in a safe space can save your life, can change your life, change your trajectory, change your support network drastically. But awareness in a space that is not open-minded, not safe, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I hope that tangibly answers your question. We start with awareness. Name it. What did it, what provoked you? What stood out to you? What, what are the six or the seven that you identify in your immediate or extended family? And what has that done to you? Right? You cannot change or fix. We're not here to fix people. I can't do not play, aim to play God. But what do you, what, which one of those resonate in you individually as yeah. a family member? Let's, yeah. let's work on you, is what I often yeah. tell individuals who come to therapy. Yeah. Because, um, good night. Um, one of the issues that we have is to acknowledge where we are at. Because, yeah. for, first and foremost, um, great presentation. Um, I, I, 
I, I was looking at our 13 and see how much myself <laughs> and and when when you mention our 13 um I, I mean it's amazing how many as an individual yeah yeah cuz yeah. so many times we 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 want to identify others with all these but if we present ourselves before the mirror right now maybe most of us are we we pass six and are in need of help so i was looking at acknowledging yeah. where we are at acknowledging is important and as you said to be aware of something in mm -hmm. in a negative environment it will cause more damage than good likewise <laughs> li likewise yes. if you acknowledge where you are at and the level you are at and you don't have that kind of help then you are in for big trouble just the same you know yes. just the same yeah. you understand yeah. and if if we look around us we'll find so many people but i agree 100 yeah. percent because it's pretty Oh, sorry. I no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, man, go ahead. Go, go ahead. go ahead. Go <laughs> ahead. I was, was going to say, because it can be, the, the more we know of, like, of any co uh, topic, the more we know, it is provoking not to be able to use that knowledge. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So I like, think back to when you were like learning how to spell, or learning how to read, or yeah, learning how to write. Excited bike, to and share. Then, oh, no, you can't write it right for the next two weeks. Like, that's provoking. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, yeah. It's hard to taste water and then never be given water again. Just, yes. Just be given like yes. water. Right? It's hard. Yeah. You know what it tastes like now. Yeah. So the minute you gain awareness, such as like gaining information like this, yeah. you are already, if you remember the paradigm I showed earlier, yeah. that education or knowledge, awareness, you're already tipping towards the scale of wanting to be healthy. But the minute you, you embrace this notion in an unhealthy dynamic or amongst someone who's not safe, not open-minded, you're shoved back into the realm of negativity, which brews for, for mental illness or for mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Professor Sam Batkin and Batman also quoted, I, I quoted him for the following, he says, a healthy family provides some form of firewall. So he acknowledges we are to be protective of our family. It is, it, it is a norm to have structure. Sometimes it calls, depending on where you are living in what, what country, we're going to be a little bit more rigid than in other countries because safety is, is the context of safety varies, right? And so mm. things that are, we're allowed to leave our backyard door open, maybe here in Ontario, Canada, in Mississauga, but I dare not do that in another third world country yeah. with my three children, as an example, right? Like, so that he understands the form of like having a protection, a firewall, but a healthy family always allows and lets in relevant information, mm -hmm. right? Allows family members to grow, develop their helpful support networks, has interactions, socialize, and, and those are dynamics of a healthy family. That, and that, that eliminates or decreases chances of brewing mental illness. Yeah. That Even that healthy family will endure mental health challenges because mm. life is not perfect, nor does everything always go your way, right? Yeah. God works in mysterious ways for those of us who do believe and have relationship uh, with him. But however, when a family refuses to let you grow in information, grow, grow in having relationships with other individuals outside of the family, it limits your interactions, limits your socializing. It's essentially a cult. Mm. And anything synonymous with a cult cannot brew something healthy. Yeah. Right? It yeah. literally brews mental illness. Yeah. And I, so what do you do if if as you mentioned, sharing it with in a space with your family? What if you find this and um you're excited because you mentioned it? And I have seen that for myself personally, you know, finding about finding out about stuff like these, and I'm very you know, provoke to let everybody know and to be excited about it and introducing it to persons that you find that they are not so excited yeah. about it. How do I go about, how do we go about um, doing that? Because I, you, we cannot become unaware and we don't want to go over the, 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 the threshold of not being healthy. We want to go to being healthy. So what if it is, you didn't know that they weren't going to be accepting or healthy. And then when you open it, you find out that it's not. And it's maybe 
more challenging to deal mm-hmm. with. How yeah. do you deal with a situation like that? Yeah, it's more than you. Mm-hmm. No, if I heard, I, it was it was the art, it was lagging a little bit. So I just want to reiterate what I have heard or I believe to be the question. What, I heard you say uh, the, essentially the essence of how do you safely uh, open up and what do you do? Yeah. To identify Basically, yes. Yes. Some of these negative traits in your family. Was mm. that the question? Okay. Yes. So, um, a big uh, in the context of therapy, I've supported individuals to expand their emotional intelligence. This means learning to identify social awareness, uh, self awareness. Social awareness is something completely underestimated in today's society, particularly um, my BIPOC community, people of color. This notion of not just not just um, you'll hear the common phrase, oh. My spirit doesn't take them. Or we'll hear the common phrase, I just know something is off in the room. I came in the room and everyone stopped talking. So they must be talking about me. That, that, that's not the social awareness yeah. I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, so, the social awareness that means you enter the room and you can notice different people's, uh, people's different communication styles. Who's more inclined to communicate with you by, when you're by, the, by yourself, just one-on-one in the room, and they're very open verbally. But now when we're in a family setting, they're not very open verbally and they're much more reserved. It, it, that, noticing things like this of each family member will help you better understand who to risk opening up to. And I say risk on purpose. Sometimes it is quite the risk to yeah. open up and share like, hey, you know what? I've been thinking, I've been noticing, you know, that like grandma always brings up the past and everyone honors her. Everyone, that she's a matriarch of our family. We love her. We dare not disrespect her. But I just don't think that negativity is good for us. Yeah. Once you have expanded your emotional intelligence, your social awareness, you're paying attention to the room, who's in the room, how do they behave in the room, yeah. right? Then it's easier to identify who is this person to take that risk with. Mm-hmm. It's not always mom and dad Yeah. just because they're mom and dad, right? And it's not always your auntie. It's not all you have to be conscious of like who operates as what, as such in the room. And sometimes it's hard to tell. You don't have access to everyone, mm-hmm. right? And so I do, I admit, sometimes it is a trial and error. And that is a huge risk for, for many people. Because I was but just again, going to say, I was just going to ask, what if you, you took the risk thinking that maybe mom or dad or auntie would have been the one, and then that's not the one, and then it blows up. How do you deal with that spill off? Where no, it's no attention in yeah. the family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this, this 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 happens far too often. This notion of like, you know, what I I thought I just I, out of respect I turned to mom or I turned to dad. That was my first go to. Even full blown idols. This is not only children that I'm quoting, and then that blowing up in their face or that having a negative feedback. Many times uh, they come to realize my clients come to realize this what you're bringing to this family member is not you. Yeah, is right. Yeah. The fact that you're bringing to them, it, it's not rocket science. They have seen this, heard it, felt it, yeah. but they were not given permission or grace to identify it. So they most likely don't have the skill set to help you now identify mm-hmm. it. And, right? and often the person who identifies these patterns in their family is playing the role of what I call the trailblazer. Yeah. No one has walked this path before. Many people have probably identified that we're rather negative, we're full of perfectionism, we're rigid. There's some wrongful intimacies in this family. A lot of people, it's never news. It's, it's, it's always well known, but has anyone acted yeah. on it? Has anyone took a stance? Has anyone sought support outside of the family? Because mm-hmm. ma- many times I say to my clients, be- before you dare speak up to someone in the family, make sure you have one or two people outside of the mm-hmm. family that you can lean on. Yeah. Whether that is a coach who will Respect, whether that is a mentor, whether that is a friend, like someone outside the family unit, because mm. many times, ta- nine times out of ten, the family unit is very in sync. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not always in sync in a positive way, mm. right? If, if we're not going to change what hasn't what what appears to be working, there's a lot of family members. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and so that's the first step. Again, and you have to build your support network, and it can't only be within your family. No. All right. Um, I I was looking at it at this right. Outside of the family, a lot of people persons look to church, right? Mm-hmm. But based on the thirteen that you identified, I've seen a lot of these being displayed mm. in church. In the 
church. In the church. Yes. And yes. We, we talk about the rigidity. Yes. We talk about even the way we dress mm -hmm. and all of that. We, mm -hmm. we have seen this. And yep. when, when you mention um, this is a form mm -hmm. of cult, I am now looking yeah. Yeah. how we operate and function oh. within the Christian faith. If we are not careful, Mm -hmm. We are acting or operating yeah, as a cult, is. as a body like of a cult. cult. Uh, yeah, as a cult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, because. It's affecting people yeah, mental, mental it, it, health. yeah, because I've seen people who usually socialize and mm -hmm. talk to people, but once they get saved and they yeah. get in church, then they are taught a certain way and they. Maybe because the scripture said, uh, be ye separated from among them. They separate themselves totally from individual, from family members, from even the friends that they grew up with. You understand? And, and, and so this is a concern because people are looking to the church and, mm -hmm. and they are looking for the church to help them with all these 13 um, that you would have identified. That the, the, the behavioral pattern yes. that need to be changed. We are now saying that we are in serious trouble then. Because even the pastor yeah, yeah. <laughs> have, have, have a few of these. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. right? And if all of these is so combined. The truth, the truth of the matter is. Oh. Yeah. If, if, if all of Sorry, these I, 13. I, I if, yeah. If all of these 13 are combined within the leadership of the church, then we are in trouble. Because if we have 14 individuals or 13 individuals in leadership and each person carry one of these, <laughs> then, then we are really in trouble. Yeah, we're in big, big trouble. <laughs> big trouble. Yeah. But yeah. if you hear me out, yeah. a, a, a healthy family has... Because no family is perfect. No, right? yeah, yeah. You have five of these, which means, and, and by having five of the 13, it means majority of your family doesn't condone these things. Majority of your family calls these things out. Majority of your family is call, constantly picking up the kids, offering to take them out, or saying, you know what, I'm going to call for whatever I need to call because I heard what happened over there at, at so and so's house. Like majority of the healthy family, although the, the context of fam healthy family will have five of those things. Majority of the family members will be completely against it and call it out. Mm -hmm. Right? And so they are. Mm -hmm. Faithful to keep the family functioning and, and healthy. They will make a wrong majority of them don't uh, prescribe to the five that the minority in the family are prescribing to. In the unhealthy family, the, the ratio is flipped. The amount of people who aren't associated or following these three, 13 steps are smaller than the amount of people who are abiding by these 13 things. And that's what makes it a mentally ill family. But to your point of like, what about in the church? The truth of the matter is any organization that is made up of people will have these challenges. Yeah. It's just the context tonight. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the church is not. The church is made up of people. They're gonna have. One, as, you, as you heard the stat earlier, one in five Canadians is dealing with mental illness. Mm -hmm. There are more than five people in yeah. these churches, mm -hmm. so they're bound to have individuals yeah. with mental illness. The issue is, are we addressing them? Yes. Right? Are we yeah. holding? Uh, are we having workshops? Are we expanding? Are we making sure that our ratio is more of the uh, healthy than mm -hmm. the unhealthy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and it's indeed factual, as you mentioned, um, any and every organization, because being a, a past member of the JCF, we, I, I personally could identify in many of our leaders some of these things, and, and they believe that they are the right thing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. you, you can't tell them that, guess what, this, this is not right. You know, and and this is why we have so much um situation that exists today. You know, because mm -hmm. persons fail to understand 
that they too need some form of health yeah. to change. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and someone was saying, um, Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, that's that's the correct word. Yeah, I, I, I love, I really, <laughs> I really love how you put that mm. that quote. Unfortunately, church is not a perfect place, and yes, it will not be, but we are looking for it to be at a level where we can be, we can reach people with with situation that family cannot deal with. But as you said, unfortunately, you know, it, it is not a perfect place. Just like in the work environment, you know, it's, it's, it's not perfect. But, mm -hmm. but. So, what's the effect of, 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 of mental ill health on the family? What does it looks like, look like? What's the, the effect it has on the family <clears throat> the audio system glitched or not are you guys able to hear me or the yes Sorry, is Samantha, is anyone able to hear? Yes, I'm hearing you. Yeah. What's wrong with the internet tonight? But it's slugging. Okay, the video's back. Samantha, so, maybe if you turn your video off, we can hear the audio better you could that. all right hearing better so i was asking what's the effect of all of this on the family how does it really affect the family Mental illness affects the family tremendously. Mental illness can spread as to it. it uh, that question is equivalent to saying like, how does a cold or how does someone get diagnosed with cancer? How does someone getting COVID in a family affect the family? It's those the exact same impacts of that physical disease is the same thing with mental illness. Mental illness is just invisible. So when people, when someone in the family has a cold, uh, they, mm -hmm. the family often it spreads or people have to come around and try and help that person. Someone has to stay home with the person to help. Same thing. Mental illness weighs 